Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two for this news bulletin today. This is Thursday, September 20th, 2012. So, we left off with this article. Uh, Russian Foreign Minister, U.S. aid trying to influence elections, which is why they were trying to get him out of there. And of course, they're saying, oh, you're squashing democracy. And that, um, that uh, what? That several Russian opposition groups, which not coincidentally received large portions of their funding directly from U.S. government grants, bashed the ban, saying that they proved that Putin wanted to continue to retain control over society in Russia. Okay, and also what? Because this is what we're about to get into. The statement insisted also from Russia, saying that they were worried about, in particular, about the meddling in the Caucasus region. So, gunmen kill Russian police officer in uh, Restiv, Dagestan. This is from September 13th. Been waiting to get to this. Russian police officer has been killed and two others were wounded after a gunman attacked their patrol car in the violence-plagued North Caucasus Republic of Dagestan. Security forces have launched a large-scale investigation into the incident and a manhunt is underway to apprehend the perpetrators. So, and uh, they did a good job because they did catch them. The Russia forces killed five militants in uh, this area, Ingushetia. So Russian law enforcement forces have killed five militants during a counterterrorism operation in Northern Caucasus Republic. The local police forces attempted to intercept a sedan with five people uh, on board during a special operation in the village. The source said that the occupants of the car responded with gunfire who were killed in the ensuing skirmish. Three of the slain militants have been identified as leaders of the local militant gang responsible for a number of serious crimes including attacks on police and state officials. Then we have Russian forces killed three militants in Balkaria. So this is just a day after the other one from the 19th in a different uh, different area, different region. Law enforcement forces have killed three militants during the special operation. Earlier, the Russian Interior Ministry announced that the operation had liquidated the self-styled Emir. This is actually from September 14th. Russian forces killed militant leader in Dagestan. They've killed the leader of the militant group, uh, Kislayer, uh, along with his comrade, as they put it, as they engage in bitter clashes with Russian soldiers. So I've covered this before about how these are actually Western-backed terrorists on um, Russia's doorstep to create instability. So Dagestan, Syria comes to Russia. So it says here on the 28th, uh, a sheik acknowledged the spiritual leader of the Thomas Russian Republic of Dagestan was assassinated. It goes on, it says that the murder target had been carefully sel uh, selected. The sheik was a 75-year-old Sufi Muslim and had played a critical role in attempting to bring about reconciliation in Dagestan between the jihadist Salafi Sunni Muslims and other factions, many of whom in Dagestan see themselves as the follower, followers of the Sufi. With no replacement of his uh, moral stature and respect visible, authorities fear possible outbreak of religious war in the tiny Russian Autonomous Republic from September 12th. So all these articles that I just covered were all after September 12th. So it goes on. And it says that ethnic Muslim populations in this region of Russia and the former Soviet Union, including Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and into China's province, have been the target of various U.S. NATO intelligence operations since the Cold War ended in 1990. Washington sees manipulation of Muslim groups as the vehicle to bring uncontrollable chaos to Russia and Central Asia. It is being carried out by some of the same organizations engaged in creating chaos and destruction inside Syria against the government of Bashar al-Assad. In a real sense, as Russian security services clearly understand, if they don't succeed in stopping the jihadist insurgency in Syria, it will come home to them via the Caucasus. So this is perhaps the most dangerous U.S. intelligence operation ever, playing globally with Muslim fundamentalism, which is what they're doing. So as Putin watches war games, he tells soldiers to boost Russian defense. Putin oversaw Russian military exercises on Monday, this is from the 17th, and warned soldiers that more conflicts around the world meant that they had to keep their powder dry and improve Russia's defenses. So he says, you are all educated people and you see what is happening in the world. Uh, you see, unfortunately, that the use of force is increasing in international affairs. So ahead of the presidential election earlier this year, Putin, 59 former KGB spies, said enemies were trying to provoke conflicts around Russia's border and the country's allies arguing that the country needed better weapons. So an interesting little comment here. He said that uh, the events connected to the Arab Spring, Western Arab Spring uprisings, have diminished the stature of international law, making Moscow more reliant on a strong army. So it's a little jab, I guess, uh, at the Western back uh, regime change by the mercenaries and the Al-Qaeda and that terrorists. 
Russian military brass looks to draft 50,000 men by any means, including pre-conscription conscription training from August 27th, uh, 2012. I covered this before, so, but it's just to give you a good backdrop. Um, so, yeah, it goes on there, and they proved to... Uh, approved by Vladimir Putin in September, so that on the eve of October 1st, it was issued a decree to the head of the state of the early autumn draft. This one was from July 11th, 2012, of Vladimir Putin. Timely forecasts of international events are needed. So, it says a shifting volatile world means leaders feel uneasy. This is why the U.S. Uh, government is fixed on Twitter, using it like a windsock. So it goes on, it says that Putin has urged Russian diplomats to look ahead and be ready for any even unfavorable turn of events in the international situation. We should influence more actively the situation where Russia's interests are directly involved. Looking ahead and acting accordingly, be ready for anything, uh, even the most unfavorable turn of events, he said at the, with the Russian foreign ambassadors in Moscow, and this was in July. So I've been covering lately about Georgia. Um, not Georgia in America, Georgia in um, basically near Russia. And uh, what I was talking about was the election that were coming up. Right now they have uh, Saka Shvili, I think his name is, and uh, he's a Western back puppet. And so I remember covering an article from Trend, uh, Trend Magazine, whatever, and they were saying that the EU is monitoring the elections to make sure that it's fair and democratic, i.e. they get their puppet in there. They've even dispatched Larry King to go over there and work in broadcasting as well to cover the elections. Then I saw this article, Georgia's interior minister resigns over prisoners' torture scandal amid protests. So, uh, but when you go down the comment, it's a pretty good comment. It says here, U.S. order to sacrifice this pawn uh, to be able to keep the U.S. stooge Saakashvili in office. So, but then I saw this one too. So from September 14th, the U.S. to bolster Georgia's air defenses the U.S. is to send military advisors to Georgia to help the country strengthen its air defenses. This is Obama sending a group of military engineers to Georgia in September. Okay, then uh, we travel to South America. In Central America, U.S.-backed opposition devises plots to destabilize Venezuela. This is all the way back from September 6, 2012. I've been waiting to cover this thing. You just see how many articles I have on hand waiting to cover. Uh, so this has been almost 15 days, right? that have been putting it off. The opposition has been accused by supporters of Venezuela President Hugo Chavez of planning to destabilize the country ahead of the upcoming presidential election. At a press conference on Tuesday, left-wing grassroots organizations allied with President Hugo Chavez and university groups released a declaration in which they accused the Venezuelan opposition of plotting to create a climate of terror ahead of the country's upcoming October 7th presidential election. Our principle is always to be mobilized and to be on alert against anyone attempting to sabotage the election on October 7th. They will do this to create an environment in which Venezuela will be looked upon as an outlaw state, and this will make it easier for military intervention or at least sanctions against Venezuela. So, remember, they just nabbed uh, a person with a uh, in their country coming from Colombia, uh, looked like an American with a passport coming out of Libya and Iraq and stuff like that, so probably an agent uh but then we have this 14 hurt as rival supporters clash in north venezuela from september 13th 14 people have been injured after supporters of venezuela chavez and opposition candidate uh capriles fought and threw stones in a northern state so this is support of the opposition uh group hurling stones as supporters of chavez We've also covered about uh, one of the refineries blowing up, and that could have just been a leak, gas leak, or something like that. But the but the opposition tried planning it on uh, saying that oh, it was they knew about it, and um, see, this is why we need to get him out of there. So they used it right for political means. Another fire breaks out at Venezuela's oil refinery. So two tanks in the oil refinery of Venezuela's northern state have caught fire due to a lightning during a storm. The blaze in Venezuela comes less than a month after an explosion rocked the uh, Amway refinery uh, in the Paraguana Peninsula, killing 48 people and injuring dozens of others. So yeah, you go in the comments, accidents do happen, but two such inc incidences within a month seems more than suspicious. On the face of it, this fire could be evidence of malicious intent. Somebody else said, wonder if lightning arresters were installed. And we know that they're capable of creating lightning. Um, and just actually this morning, this morning there was lightning that went off right outside my house and it scared the living shit out of me. It sounded like someone put a, threw a full stick of dynamite right on my back porch. 
And it was weird because I actually woke up right before it happened. My dog was right by my side, which is unusual, right before the lightning came and the and the big ass thunder. So it was definitely fake. I could tell. And I could tell the night before that the something was brewing. The sky just looked nasty. And um, there's just, you know, good old weather modification. They can create rain, they can create snow, they can definitely create lightning. Okay, last top Colombian drug lord arrested in Venezuela. So look at this, drug trafficker Daniel Barrera, also known as Loco Barrera or Crazy Barrera. He's like smiling, as seen in this handout photo. Uh, so yeah, Colombian president says one of the top country's top most wanted drug traffickers has been captured in neighboring Venezuela. Say the last of the great capos has fallen. Gulf drug cartel boss nabbed in northern Mexico from September, what's this, from September 3rd. So it says Mexican security forces arrest the regional leader of the notorious uh, Gulf cartel criminal gang. It says they're also, he's also known as the Commander Devil. And this other one was from September 19th. So a lot of this happening at the same time from September 4th. Grandmother of cocaine killed in Colombia. A vicious Colombian heavy known as Godmother of Cocaine who funneled millions of pounds of blow into the U.S. in the 70s and 80s was gunned down by a motorcycle hitman on Monday. Ooh, motorcycle. That's what the, what the Zionists were using against Iranian scientists. But just like everything else, it's surprising to all of us that she had not been killed sooner because she had made a lot of enemies. That's because these people uh, are on payroll. They're allowed to, to go about their business. They work with the, with the CIA and all these uh, agencies, right, to funnel this stuff. And then when they're, when they're done, like all their other leaders, like I said, Gaddafi, Saddam, whoever, um, Pol Pot, they, 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 they cut them loose. Sometimes they even let them go. Like the recent Cameron Rouge guy, you know, oh, sorry, we're going to let him go. Judge ordered CIA to turn over more documents about drug king Pablo Escobar, which in the 1980s controlled 80% of the global cocaine market. So it says the Washington-based Think Tank Institute for Policy Studies has been fighting the CIA since 2004 to force the agency to turn over documents that may reveal its links to the vigilant group in Bogota that helped track down Escobar. So apparently uh, Pepe's people persecuted by Pablo Escobar was created by rival drug smugglers, illegal right-wing militias, and maintain regular relations with Colombian police and U.S. drug agents. So it's kind of interesting, but it says, curious about the ties between the CIA and Pepe's, IPS sued the CIA in 2006 for making a legally inadequate response to a FOIA request in 04. It says the IPS complained that the CIA improperly redacted the documents it turned over and failed to perform a complete search for records on Escobar. The CIA noted that the agency would have the opportunity to claim that certain records were exempt from disclosure, i.e., the part that they had in it, right, the hand. Managing the Plaza America secret deal with Mexican drug cartels. So in a story that should have made front page headlines, Narco News investigated journalist Bill Conroy revealed that a high-ranking Sonola narco trafficking organization member claimed that U.S. officials have struck a deal with the leadership of the Mexican drug cartel. So last spring it was reported that the Mexican government had arrested three high-ranking army generals over their links to narco trafficking organizations. Conroy's latest Pete's paints a picture of simulated war in which Mexican and U.S. governments are willing to show favor to dominant narco-trafficking organizations in order to minimize the violence and business disruption in major drug plazas or markets. So a simulated war sounds a lot like the war on terror, the war on drugs. And pics of the new president with Sonola cartel lieutenant from August 10th. That's how long I've been waiting to cover this. So, so Mexican City newspapers reported the discovery of pictures of the not yet inaugurated new president who appears chummy with the man arrested, which was a Sonola cartel operator. So this is opposite the rival of the Zetas, Marines vs. Zetas. So they're on working for the Sonola against the Zetas. U.S. hunt drug cartels in Guatemala from August 29th. 200 U.S. Marines have entered Guatemala on a mission to chase local operatives of the murderous Zeta drug cartel, or stiff the competition, right? High-ranking a uh, cartel member says Operation Fast and Furious was meant to supply guns to the Sonola cartel. Hey, justice has been served. Attorney General of the Justice Department Holder has been cleared in gun walking probe. The operation allowed thousands of weapons to cross into Mexico. And Calderon, the Mexican president, defends the simulation war on drug cartels. But there's kind of a problem there because the Mexican official actually says the CIA manages the drug trade. So the soon-to-be dead Mexican official says U.S. agencies don't want to end the drug trade. Talking about Marines in Guatemala, the Honduras is looking for a charter city sponsor. Talking about a permanent base by the U.S. in Central America. To fight Nicaragua to stop sending soldiers to the School of America saying it is a symbol of death and terror. Thank you.